baby up. This is in like an endurance race in my world. And this is called the last 10 laps. After all this time you've been doing laps and you've been doing laps and you've been keeping everything together, not make, hitting your marks, not making any mistakes, saving the car, and then you just spend the last 10 laps and you go for it because that's what it really counts, the last 10 laps. We've been uh, discussing so many wonderful, important things. Um, kind of started out in a very outside the box. We went sailing with Linda at the start of this and expanded our horizons. Um, and then we really got down to the nitty gritty of our leadership and our allies. And we talked about how you can have it all and just all of this good stuff, right? Um, I want to blow you back out again because we're going to talk about the global impact of women in motorsports. We're not just about United States. We're not just about you know, our little silos that we live in. Um, we've now learned that we can learn a lot more from each other and, and we can, that we have probably a lot more in common with each other um, than we realized. But that also it is in the global, it's a, it's a global economy. Everything is really global now. So we're going to talk about, we're going to talk with some experts um, who have great careers um, and who have had some global impact. So we're going to start with that wonderful Laura Clauser, who uh, Alba Tola that was, uh, told us that that was one somebody that she's watched come up through the GM ranks. She's the sports car racing program manager at General Motors, oversees the Corvette C8R, Cadillac, and Camaro GT4 R cars, and is responsible for all future cars, sports cars racing programs. Started as a summer co-op student at General Motors before being hired full-time upon college graduation, and of course, a member of the WIMNA working group. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> Anna T Tesla Kova James, um, Tag Heuer, Heuer Porsche Formula E. She spent 15 years working with Tag Heuer. Oh, why can I say that? Leading global marketing and communications. It's a global world, but you've got to learn how to say those words that come out of the other parts of the world. Consults in global race communications at Tag Heuer Porsche Formula E team, the former head of Nissan Global Motorsports Communications for Electric Racing and the FIA Formula E World Championships. Catherine Legg, who made it, who just literally drove here from Atlanta with her puppy in the car. International racing driver since 2001, when she beat Kimi Rakuten, uh, as a, it held the lap record and was the British Racing Star Award, but then went on to do some minor things. German, uh, German touring sports cars, um, the Toyota Atlantic Championship, the British Formula 3 Series, Formula Renault UK, uh, Formula E, Ransom NASCAR Xfinity Series, Indy Cars, and the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, as well as um, the WEC, the World Endurance Championship, and is also has been a member of, of the WIMNA Working Group. Thanks for making it, dear. <laughs> Catherine Legg. <laughs> Crystal Wrigley from uh, Exxon, Fuels Technology Chief at Exxon Mobil's Technology Center, served as chemical engineer and researcher before present role of leading technology strategy and product development implementation. Early in her career, worked in quality testing and logistics in Formula One race vehicles. When I met, I couldn't believe she started with Formula One, you know, and now, I mean, it's like most people aspire to get there. Um, uses background and experience to focus on lower emissions for commercial trucking, shipping, and aviation. Our global Impact of Women in Motorsports panel. All right, race fans, welcome to the last lap of the most incredible two days, right? Yes. Right, so I feel like to get us over the finish line, I feel like we all need a little bit of movement, so I want you all to stand up. I want you to put your arms in a V for victory because we're all winners here, and on the count of three, we're going to say... Thank you, Women With Drive. One, two, three. Thank you, Women With Drive. Woo! Give yourselves a big round of applause for being here. It is an honor to be on this stage with these incredible women and to be in the same room as you all. So thank you. Thank you. I want whatever you had for breakfast. <laughs> 
Well, I don't normally drink coffee, and I've had two today, so <laughs> there you that go. That explains it, right? <laughs> oh, okay, we can breathe now. So, Laura, but to start with you, um, you know, you're, it said in here I was supposed to read you're 35 years old, and I thought, eh, I don't want to say that, but you're young. 36. 36 now. Oh, my God. As of like a week. <laughs> okay. Happy birthday. Thank Happy you. Birthday. <laughs> But you're, you are young, you know, and, um, and have a lot of responsibility and, again, dealing in a very male, you know, dominated, um, not just an industry, but, I mean, even when I go, when I, you got, let me go into the hauler there at the racetrack, you know, and, and but you're one of the guys. And, I, and, you know, I think, but I remember I talked about um, when uh, John Bishop said she drives like a man, you know, years ago. And I'm like, that people, when I tell people that story, they say, well, you offended? Well, no, I wasn't offended. So, you know, when you're one of the guys. But tell me about the work culture and then possibly it's also your work culture uh, globally, you know, in, in Europe. Yeah, I actually, I agree. Um, I've been one of the guys probably my whole life, but not in a bad way. Just growing up, you know, on a small farm and being around all of that stuff. It was just something you... You got out there, you got dirty. I helped my dad. I think he thought he was going to have a boy for his firstborn, but he got me. So that's all right. I ended up being his right-hand woman in everything that he needed. Um, and one thing that's so exciting about working for General Motors is the company embraces diversity. You can see it from the top of the company straight through. So the good news is, is when you are aspiring to be something in the company, you don't have to think, oh, are they even going to consider me because of my gender, my color, whatever. And so, no, I want to do that job. How do I get there? So that never got in the way of trying to get to the motorsport things. But what was interesting to me is when I got outside of GM's um, big old safety hug and got into motorsports where you're working with a lot more than General Motors people. You're working with the teams and all the various sponsors and suppliers that support us. Um, you realize, oh, well... GM's kind of got it right, and they're moving in a good direction. Things are a little bit different here, but, but not in a bad way. And I think the thing for me is, is getting in and establishing the trust that I need it with everybody, showing up early, staying late, being there when they needed it, answering the questions, admitting when I didn't know something and didn't try to make anything up. And that really seemed to go a long way in terms of being appreciated as being a part of it. And then also having the passion. I loved it. I loved being a part of racing from day one. I do not come from a racing family. In fact, where I grew up in Maryland, if someone said racing, they're talking about going to see horse racing down at um, uh, Pimlico. So it was a, a new world for me to get into through Formula SAE and everything along those lines, as Alba said. Um, but then, you know, just deciding this is it. This is where I want to be. I'm, I'm all in. And I think people can tell when you have that and how much you want to be there and be a part of it. And it radiates off of you, and they accept you as one of their own. And I think when that comes across crystal, crystal clear, it doesn't matter who you are. It just matters that you're there, you're willing to show up, and you're willing to work really, really hard. But was it different when you go over to Europe and, and now you know, oversee GM's racing program when you're in Europe? Yes, it is a little bit um, probably an example of something that happens a lot and you just deal with is... Uh, most of the emails I receive starts with gentlemen, comma, and then they get into it. Or the other thing is when I'm on some of the calls with um, the ACO, uh, they, they always like, it's like gentlemen and Laura. <laughs> so, um, but, but it said in a fun way with a smile and, and this and that. And, and I think so that maybe they're a little bit behind what we're doing here in, in North America. But I think if you look at the grid and, and look at the people you're seeing more women in there too. And I, I'm just getting started with the WEC, with what we're doing, but even from the couple of years that I've been there, I've seen more presence of females. And the women in motorsports group over there that the FIA does, they're growing too, which is great. So I think that there's definitely growth opportunities, but in some cases, we're a leader in this space. So you mentioned the FIA, and, and um, Tina, can, can you show that slide, or is that, because I was supposed to do that at the beginning, but we decided to do. Um, so I wanted you all to know there is an FIA Women in Motorsports Commission. Um, and so it, it was established a little over 10 years ago. And, and it is um, a really interesting, culturally, structurally different organization. I, I've only been involved with it the last two years. 
but it was actually helped give me the foundation um, of, of the idea of maybe doing something here. I said, we have to do something in North America. And it helped kind of help me sort of the foundation. And, and Laura represents um, on the engineering side. And it, we have like, that's how many countries. Look, at it's like over 30 countries they have representatives. Um, and, and they have, rep you know, Laura represents on the engineering. Um, Beth Peretta is a representative now uh, on the uh, marketing, and, and, and I'm representative for, for North America. So just want you all to know that and go to the website if you want to get more information um, because there are no boundaries. I mean, there's this ocean but there, you know, around us, but there are really no boundaries. So I did want you to know that, and you mentioned that. Thanks. Um, Anna, Hello. you were like the entrepreneurial... Um, Wave runner, uh, <laughs> literally. So, but your career, when, you, when we talked on the phone, um, you know, you have just been building and creating, and, and to me, the entrepreneurial is the world that came, the word that came to me, what globally, culturally, um, and business-wise, you know, what work you actually do. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Because you've created your own path all the way. Thank you, yeah. I think, um, first of all, I'm Australian, if you didn't pick the accent. Uh, my mom is Filipino, my dad is Czechoslovakian. I don't speak either, I speak a little bit of Italian, a little bit of Japanese. I've lived in Japan, Dubai, Paris, France, and now in the US. So global is definitely in my DNA. Uh, and what that does is it makes me definitely culturally aware and sensitive and just want to work on a global stage. Uh, and so, you know, my passion for Formula One started when I was 10 years old watching on the TV in Australia with all the different time zones. I'm uh, up late at night. Uh, you can imagine a little young Anna with a clipboard writing down lap times for Michael Schumacher. There was no internet back then, so I couldn't really look them up. Keeping these records, and that passion was there, but I didn't know that communications and marketing was even a discipline. Uh, I thought I needed to be a mechanic or an engineer to join Formula One. And when I realized that those weren't my passion, I thought, well, there goes that dream. Um, so I moved to Japan, I went through a bunch of different roles and just thought, you know, what am I really interested in? Okay, I discovered communications and marketing, did a degree, uh, worked in technology and thought, actually, how do I do this, the marketing and comms, but in motorsport? And at the time, my uh, brother-in-law, who was the head of communications for Infinity, uh, sat me down, I went to Hong Kong, sat me down next to the uh, global head of motorsport for Infinity Motorsport. And uh, they had a great opportunity to lead their Infinity Engineering Academy program uh, with the Renault Formula One team to host their events in seven different countries. So I said, thank you. Um, so I traveled all around the world and then uh, at the same time uh, made some great connections. It's all about the network. And uh, you know, my resume at the end of the day got me over the line and then led Nissan's global motorsport communications program and moved to France. I did the, the corporate thing for a while, which was incredible. You work 24 hours a day all over the time zones. Um, and it was challenging to convince the regions to spend their hard-earned marketing and communications dollars on an electric racing program. That wasn't as big now as it was five years ago. So really using your skills and talents and negotiation skills and to convince them to spend these hard-earned hard -earned dollars. And then working on a race in Saudi while you're thinking about Mexico in two weeks and then Italy in a few weeks after that uh, has been extremely challenging. And I loved it, it was amazing. Uh, during the pandemic, I moved to the US, got happily married, happily stuck here, and uh, had to leave my job in Paris. And I moved to Tampa. I thought, how am I gonna do racing in Tampa? I mean, Sebring's kind of close but far away. Daytona's kind of close but far away. What am I going to do? Am I going to have a normal job? I mean, my passion is motorsport. Um, and I got a call from Porsche who said, uh, we need somebody with your experience to look after our communications program. And we will fly you from Tampa. I went, yes. <laughs> you know, it is those connections I'm, you know, and those networks and building those relationships. And I got the call. I didn't have to seek them out. Um, and what that allowed me to do is I work for Porsche on the race weekends, and it gives me time between then to work on other clients. So I've built my own consultancy, uh, working on Formula E, Formula One, and I have other clients as well. So I've kind of built in this, you know, feel the feelings, like Mike was saying this morning, it's like I wanted a, a bit more freedom when I was 
in the corporate world and that's what I've kind of built for myself and so happy to be here. <laughs> wow. I'm going to come back in my next life as you. <laughs> Japan, all over the world, right? Yeah. Well, Catherine, you and I have known each other quite a while. Um, not that long. Well, We're not that old. Yeah. But, um, no, I, and your passion and natural ability behind the wheel of a race car is something you know I've been impressed with from the, from the get-go. Um, and I know that your family was very thrilled, particularly your dad, in really being supportive. And you have literally raced all over the world. Um, but how, how did you, uh, you told me a story that you just told me that I didn't know about you. If you would share that story first and then, and then lead into a little bit more about, you know, the, the, the similarities maybe or the differences like, you know, the, of racing for race teams in the U.S. versus racing. I know that you've had some not so great experiences when you raced over in Germany and in Europe. Is, yeah, so... But start with the story that you shared with me of how you really got started. So uh, nine-year-old Catherine was a bit of an adrenaline junkie, a bit of a tomboy, and uh, didn't really know what she wanted to do with her life. She wanted to be a fighter pilot to start with. And then I decided maybe I'll be an economist. And I thought, no, probably not disciplined enough to be an economist. Um, and I saw a television program about a lady called Ellen who single-handedly sailed around the world. And I was blown away by this Ellen lady. And I can't for the life of me, because I've hit the wall too many times in my career, I can't remember her last name, so sorry. You might have to Google it. Um, but she was like young, independent, had, there was no gender barriers. It was, it was inspiration to me. So I wrote her letters. And um, I thought, well, if she can do that, then I can be a racing driver. And so, again, Formula One was my, my ultimate goal when I was growing up. I raced go-karts every weekend. Um, my dad and I are super close, and I was really lucky. He gave up smoking to be able to afford tires to put on my go-kart. So um, we traveled around England. Obviously, you can tell by the accent. I'm not from Louisiana. <laughs> um, and, uh, and into Europe. And I was very fortunate that I got opportunities to, to move forward. And actually, the first opportunity I got, probably going on a bit now, but um, I called Lynn. This is like 20-year-old Catherine now. I called Lynn and I said, hey, I'm a really good race car driver, and you're doing this shootout in Texas Motor Speedway. Can I be part of it? And she said, send me your CV. And then uh, I called her again. About a week later, I said, hi, can I be part of the shootout? She was like, yeah, no, sorry. I don't know who you are, and you're from England. We don't like those English people. No. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'll turn up anyway. So helmet in hand, turned up in Texas, and trust me, as an English girl getting off a plane in August, and the doors open, you're like, holy cow, people live here? <laughs> this is crazy. Um, never driven on an oval before. So um, that's how I first met Lynn. I think she was impressed by my tenacity, and I think I re reminded her a little bit of herself in a way. Um, so from then, I literally did. Hey, wait, wait, wait! You were the fastest of the group. Second, <laughs> you get this story wrong every time. I told you it was not my decision. Know, it was the owner of the team, and she had said no. And I told you to come anyway. I know. So I just like that, giving you stick. That is, that is the <laughs> dog goddess truth. And then you and were the fastest. And and then I won the scholarship, right? So I thought, oh, yeah, I'm moving to America, as long as it's not Texas. And <laughs> <laughs> I love Texas, by the way. Don't get me wrong. I'm just trying to be funny. Um, so I thought, OK, this is my one big shot, because didn't come from a rich family um, and really wanted to be a race car driver. And then won the scholarship. But it didn't happen, unfortunately. As everybody knows, in racing, things kind of fall apart relatively easily. So um, back, to the, back to the drawing board, as it were, and um, bumped into a lady called Vicky O'Connor, who I know a lot of you know here. And she ran the Atlantic series. And I said, OK, how do I get into racing in North America? Because at that time, as well, you had Lynn, you had Sarah Fisher. Um, and there were so many more opportunities for women over here. Like Formula One was totally closed off to, to any kind of female participation, be it driving, engineering, anything. There was no women in the paddock, literally no women in the paddock. So I thought America is the land of opportunity and the glass is always half full, so I'll try and come over here. I stalked Kevin Kalkoven, 
literally. He was buying Cosworth in England and I turned up on his doorstep and refused to leave until he saw me, which luckily I didn't get arrested and he gave me a ride, so that worked <laughs> out well in the end. Um, and I won a few Atlantic races and, and got the opportunity to drive Formula One car and race IndyCar and Formula E and NASCAR and IndyCar and a, and a bunch of other things that I kind of skipped through very quickly, but I don't want to, uh, don't want to hog the mic. Do you think there will be a Formula One driver, a female Formula One driver, in... In our lifetime? In our lifetime. I would like to think yes, but my gut tells me at the moment I don't, I don't see anybody coming up through that has been given the right grooming, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean, it's a numbers game, right? At the end of the day, you've got how many hundreds of thousands of young boys all over the world who are racing go-karts right now with their one goal in life is to be the next Michael Schumacher, Lewis Hamilton, whoever you know they idolize at the time. Um, how many are there in Formula One? Like 30, maybe. Um, so the chances of any one of those hundreds of thousands of young boys getting there, they need the money, the drive, the talent, the luck, everything else, right? They also need to be raised in an area where you have the competition, and that is either... At the moment, don't hate me for saying this, but this is probably England, right? Because you come up through the European ranks, you go to Formula One. There aren't many people coming out of North America going to Formula One at the moment. So if there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of boys and only like 30 of them make it, and that's not every year, only one or two a year get picked because the rest stay, there's only maybe a couple of hundred, a few hundred at most girls doing it. What are the chances that one of those girls is going to be as good as those guys? And if they are, they need to be protected at all costs, <laughs> right? <laughs> and they need to be given the right education of how to get there. So, and they need to stay hungry and they need to do all the hard things. I think the reason that we are up here right now is because we dug in and we really wanted it and we were not going to let anybody tell us no, right? Every single one of us. So I think it's it's coming, but I don't know that it's there yet, and I wish it was, but um, I think there's lots that could be just on the cusp, you know? But I don't know that there are any that are gonna go and rival Lewis at the moment, unfortunately. I wish there was. Thanks, thanks. I thought I'd ask that because I have a feeling anybody would ask that. Uh, Crystal, yeah, so most of us, uh, not most of us, but most people, when they're in a career, they aspire to get to that level of Formula One or in Europe at one of the top, type top teams. And when we talked, and you go, well, I started in Formula One. I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, and then you worked your way um, around and as a, at a very high level, you know, in chemical engineering um, at ExxonMobil. So tell us about your experiences. Yeah, so I was very lucky. Um, you know, I joined ExxonMobil out of an internship, so just recommend definitely intern. Um, and my first job, you know, I sit down with my boss and he says, well, you're going to work for the McLaren Mercedes Formula One team. You're going to do fuel development, logistics, and quality. I had no exposure to Formula One before that time. So I said, oh, that sounds great. And he said, and by the way, you can't make a mistake. You know, it was like, you have to be precise and it needs to be precise every time. Um, so I got thrown in, you know, right at, at the start. And keep in mind, I did have a technical expert lead that was a part of the team, you know, obviously uh, leading the effort. So it was an amazing first job. Um, I got to travel uh, over to Europe for the first time, uh, part of the Formula One team, and work with the Mercedes engineers uh, and, and go to the McLaren facility in Woking, which if you had never been there, I mean, it's like you walk in and uh, just blown away uh, in terms of the immaculateness and amazing technology. Um, so I worked, you know, for two years, and Kimmy, Kimmy was actually the driver um, for McLaren at the time that I was there, and Lewis Hamilton made his driving debut uh, for the second year that I was part of the team. Um, but from there, you know, as a chemical engineer, um, I looked at Formula One as the epitome of performance and the ability to drive technology innovation. Um, and so, uh, you know, I was told, you're starting here, you know, every, everywhere else is going to kind of be down from that point. And honestly, you know, my next couple of jobs, I was like, oh, I need to get back to Formula One. That was so exciting. Um, but what, what it did do for me at the start of my career is it showed me when you push beyond what you think the limit is, right? You say, here's the boundary. Nope, 
we've got to push further. Um, with innovation, with a team and collaboration, you can achieve amazing things. And we were able to do that you know, through the Formula One. Um, and then I was able to use that experience to develop my career. Um, where I've been in products, and it was funny, Bridget mentioned earlier today that, you know, when she was in sixth grade and I was a freshman in college, I said, engineering's about making products that you can bring to the world, and, and honestly, that's what I do. So I'm like, oh man, I thought I changed a lot, but not really. I'm pretty much doing what my passion was back, uh, you know, at the start of college. And so I went through a lot of different roles in ExxonMobil and continued to advance and create new products in diesel, marine, aviation. Um, and full circle, I became the chief fuels technology engineer about a year ago, and Formula One came back into my portfolio. So now, um, you know, I have a, a larger portfolio, but part of the team that's working on fuel development for Red Bull Racing uh, is in mine. And shout out to the Fuel and Lubricant Technology Group. Red Bull's in first place right now with the driver and hopefully in the Constructors' Championship. So we're really excited to be part of the team that's advancing technology and, and you know, driving a winning racing team. It's awesome. Fantastic. I mean, um, I know that in a motorsports arena that a lot of uh, OEMs, when, you know, they, they, it's not just about selling cars. It's, it's about this transfer of technology, but then also the transfer of the engineers coming in. Um, I used to wonder why, you know, when the car wouldn't run, I'm like, we'll fix it. And they're like, well, we'll just have to change the box or do something. But they, this, this is, it was a test bed for a lot of stuff, but also a test bed for the people to learn how to, to think quickly, to be solution oriented, to, to, to demand performance and solutions um, because there was a race next week. So it wasn't like in the corporate world where they could kind of, oh, you know, we'll figure this out and we have to delay the, the, the launch, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So I, I commend the fact that that's helped your career, it sounds like, and, and how fabulous. And, and the same kind of with Anna, where you, you know, you've had that exposure um, and you didn't get hung up on um, getting. It's the word, you know, getting so caught up in the fact that I'm, I'm, this is what I'm doing and everything isn't downhill from here, you know, learn from it um, and then maybe it'll come back into your life, right? Yeah, yeah which is very cool, very cool. So I, I hope that at least these stories here um, show that this is a global, you know, um, a global industry. I mean, the thing about motorsports is that you can, yes, there are certainly great career opportunities in a lot of disciplines that I think we don't even know exist, and hopefully we'll find out that they do, um, that maybe suit your skill set or your interests. Um, but it's also, it isn't just that job here with that company um, that it could really broaden and, and maybe take you all around the world because um, it is a global sport, and, and I, not a lot of industries have that. Not a lot of sports have that. Um, you know, they, they're very centralized, localized, re regionalized, um, or just within this country. We have five minutes according to my timer up there, so um, I'm going to open it up to some questions because we do have opportunity to do that if you all are still with us. It's the last 10 laps, remember, or the last two laps now. We're down to the last two. Do we have any questions for any of our panelists? Hello, so I'm Elizabeth from Sebring International Raceway. I've had the opportunity to meet um, both Laura and, I'm so sorry, Catherine. <laughs> um, Catherine, you kind of skipped over your IMSA, you know, history and things that you've done with the sports car racing world there, specifically thinking towards gear racing. Um, I think that what you did with gear racing would be a really cool thing to speak about to this group. And then if there's any opportunities that you felt like that gave you from working with gear racing and if you know how did that affect media for you things like that yeah good question um so gear racing was a for those of you who don't know it was an all-female initiative to basically spotlight highlight whatever word you want to use women in racing so we had all female drivers we tried to have some female crew um all the way up through my racing career i was a racing driver, so we're selfish, okay? It's all about, it was all about Catherine and where I could get in my racing career. And it got to a certain point in my life where I was like, you know what? I'm not making it to Formula One. I still haven't quite come to terms with it yet, but you know, I'm working on it. Um, and I thought, what can I do to help the nine-year-old Catherines of the future? 
And actually, it's as much STEM as driving because I would love to find young female engineers, um, not just female, but really diversity because I feel like they're under... Not, it's difficult. It's, it's like there's a certain amount of gimmick that comes with it, and I really think that that's awful, and I want to get rid of that, and I want to just give opportunity to the best people for the job, whether you're black, white, male, female, or, or whatever it is. So around about the time that the FIA started the Women in Motorsport Commission, I decided that I would be the female driver ambassador for it. And so I did that for a few years, trying to impart what I had been through and my knowledge and what I had come up against and what I think, you know when your parents say to you, Not, don't do as I do, do as I say, they're right, right? Like, I've been through it all, so if I can just hand that over to you, then you'll be like years ahead of where I was at the same time. So gear racing was really a culmination of me wanting to get other young girls interested in racing in any way, shape, or form, like not just to be driving. So I thought, okay, if they can see this, that we have female engineers, that we have female drivers, then maybe when they go home, they'll be like, Daddy, I want to be an engineer, or Daddy, I want to be the rear tire changer, because that's really cool. Um, so I thought maybe I was doing something good and giving something back, and uh, we tried to make it not a gimmick, right? We tried to be taken seriously. So we picked the best women that we could for the job. And there's a similar program going on in Europe at the moment called Iron Dames. Um, and so really, really strong people and, and try and make a difference and an impact. And that inevitably does get um, press coverage and, and um, it is a marketing tool, but uh, it, that wasn't why we did it. The reason that we did it was because we wanted to make a difference and we wanted everybody to see it. And you know what? It was so worth it at the autograph signing at Daytona when we did it the first the, for the first time. I can't remember what year it was, a few years ago now. Um, all these young girls came up to us and they were like, oh my God, I want to be a race car driver. Or, oh my goodness, I want to be an engineer. And like they came and they hugged you and they like you saw it in their eyes and you saw their passion and drive and the fact that they love racing. And they had no idea that there were girls in racing. They thought there was a boy's sport, right? And there's so many things that you grow up, you don't consciously think, okay, that's a boy job, that's a girl job or anything else. It's not somebody telling you that that's what it is. It's just that you see people in those roles, and so your brain like associates the people with the roles. And I was very fortunate that my dad and my mum, but my mum thinks racing's noisy, smelly, dirty, and dangerous, and hates it. Um, <laughs> so, but she also instilled in me, you can be anything that you want to be. It doesn't matter if it's a boy job or a girl job, right? So let's get rid of that stigma by having people like the ladies up on the stage right now saying, you know what, it's not, it's a gender neutral job and I can do it just as well as anybody else. And I cannot tell you, Jim Leo is sitting in the audience somewhere, I know, because he texted me earlier, and he knows this, but I can't explain, like when I first did Champ Car, everybody was like, girls aren't strong enough to be race car drivers, girls aren't strong enough to be, and I heard that hundreds of times, right? Because the cars are big and heavy and burly and blah, blah, blah. I worked hard in the gym with in the gym with Jim, <laughs> and uh, we completely dispelled that myth. And now, in the last five, six, seven years, not one person has come up to me and said girls aren't strong enough to be in Formula One or anything like that. Because m myself, Simona, everybody else proved that that's not an issue. So we just need to keep proving it, and we need to keep being those role models for those young girls. And hopefully, in ten years' time from now. It'll be a totally different discussion and, and it won't be uh, anything unusual. I, I'm just going to maybe add to that and I might be out of school on this, but, I, and I forget what GEARS, I always, G-E-A-R had a, it was an acronym for something, right? Yeah. Um, but unfortunately that program was strong and I mean I remember being there at the 24 hours and all that. And I don't know the details and it's not the appropriate time, but the funding went away. I mean, in other words, the person that was funding that essentially that disappeared. And that happens so much, where there's just not the continuity of the support. You know, everybody goes with a great idea, and maybe there's somebody that has a lot of money, and maybe it's a wonderful idea, and they throw a bunch of money at it, and then they disappear, you know, whatever, for whatever reason. And, and it's really hard when you're with, I don't care what, whether you're particularly in racing, but in any job, 
if that job goes away, you're back with your feet starting over again. And, um, and sometimes that happens. It's hard. It's hard to sort that out. So I, I, you were kind enough not to bring that up, but because she asked specifically, I wanted to, you know, well, not put the ball on, or the, on the bogey on your back that the program went away. Yeah, and actually that's a really good point because um, it makes you question it. Like, okay, maybe I'm not doing the right thing. Maybe I shouldn't be championing women. I shouldn't be championing diversity. Maybe I should just be focusing on Catherine and Catherine's career and I'll just be another race car driver doing what I'm, I love to do and that I'm good at. But that, that's not who I am. I would never give up on anything. So whenever the opportunity arises to do that, I want to, uh, I want to uh, make a difference. I really do. You do make a difference. <laughs> All right, um, now we're over time, um, right? A minute and 58 <laughs> seconds, but thank you for the question. Um, thank you, Catherine, thank you for driving over Sorry. here at the last minute when you got a little mixed up on schedule. Um, thank you all. And thank you, every panelist, every um, person that contributed to this. Um, I think it was amazing. I think you guys are amazing. You, you've, you know, you've been here um, to, to be engaged literally from yesterday. I feel like we've been here for maybe a week, but um, <laughs> I, you know, it's just been an amazing experience and I wanna thank you all.